Hey, good morning, everyone. Great to see all of you here today on this great Memorial Day weekend. Hey, sometimes as a pastor, I go to certain events, uh, and I was at an event a few years ago, and I sat at a table, round table, with like seven or eight people I had never met before in my life, and uh, the subject came up about retirement. And here's one thing I've noticed. Certain people, if you say, when are you going to retire? They'll go, one year, four weeks, three days. I mean, they just know. I, I did this, or it'll go 10 years. They just know. So we're around the table. We're talking about retirement. And uh, the one guy said, well, what are you, you going to do when you retire? And he goes, I was just talking to my wife about that today. And I said to her this morning when I left, when I retire, I'm going to sit on the couch and watch TV all day long, every day of the year. Everybody kind of, you know, like, what? And I said, if you do that, you're going to be dead in 12 months. <laughs> okay, that caught his attention. I said, because when you live life with no purpose, you're eventually going to give up on life. And if that doesn't do it to you, your wife is going to murder you at the end of those 12 months. So either way, it's a death sentence if you do that as well. When we lack purpose and meaning, it really takes the life right out of us, doesn't it? it? Causes all kinds of problems. I just read a survey of young adults ages 18 to 24. This is not surprising, not rocket science, but a lot of 18 to 24 year old adults uh, really lack purpose. They don't know where they're going with their lives. They don't have uh, a direction to go. And in fact, what they said, you know, often what you read is that when you begin to make decisions that match up your, to your purpose in life, you feel like an adult. Well, the problem is when you're 18 to 24, sometimes you don't have it figured out yet. You don't know what your, where your purpose is, where your life is going, your career and everything else. You just don't know yet, right? And so only about 25% feel like they are adults or they have any purpose in life because they're just struggling to find that. And so it's a big problem with young adults, and we shouldn't be surprised by that. And often what we do is we confuse existing in life, coasting through life, we confuse that with happiness. We confuse that with thriving. And just because you exist and you're going to work every day, you get up on Monday, well, not tomorrow for most of you, but you, know, you get up on Tuesday, you go to work, and you just think, oh, it's just another, just another day, right? All right. I Googled, uh, on, I put on Amazon, I said, uh, all the books with happiness. Oh, my gosh. There's a happiness crave out there. There's like happy money. Interesting concept, happy money. There's uh, uh, happiness for beginners. <laughs> All right, well, what's up with that? Or the happiness advantage or atomic happiness. What in the world is that about? You see, happiness without purpose doesn't last. It just leads to insignificance. Because you can be happy and you just feel kind of have this happiness fix. But if you don't have any purpose in life, it leads you to insignificance because you don't know what you're doing. And it makes you actually a relatively shallow person. You become selfish and self-absorbed, right? When you don't know your purpose, it's all about you. You just want to make sure it's feeling good. But nothing is more exciting than when you feel like, hey, this is God's purpose for my life. God wants me to do this. And you feel like you've just hit the sweet spot in life. Why am I here? What difference does it make? Here's what I want to talk about today. Here's our big idea. When you know your purpose, you can persevere. Here's what I mean by that. If you think, hey, God's purpose in my life is to be a school teacher. And I'm going to teach seventh graders. Lord have mercy on you. But anyway, so you're going to teach seventh graders. I probably offended seventh grade teachers now. But And you know, when times get hard, right? You say, I don't quit. But if you know your purpose, you're not going to quit. Same is true for our marriages. God has a purpose for your marriage. God has a purpose for your family. When life is hard and you have problems, and I want to tell you, you're going to have, you're going to have, you're going to have problems in life. There's no doubt about it. But when those hard times come, you can get through those. You can persevere. Why? Because you know the purpose behind what you're doing. Right? You got, got that? Okay. We're going to look at the life of the Apostle Paul. And his name is going to be Saul, and I'll explain a little bit. His 
name in Hebrew is Saul. His name in uh, Greek is Paul. And so uh, he has an incredible shift in the purpose of his life. We call it his conversion story. And it's found in Acts chapter 9, verse 1. And what you can do is you can read on the screen with me, Acts chapter 9, verse 1. You can open your phone and use that QR code in front of you, and all the notes will pop up. Or you can use your Uversion app and hit events, and Grace Community Fellowship will pop up. So here we go. Meanwhile, Saul was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, the word way means Christians. They used to call them the way at the very beginning. Whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So he asked for these letters, and it's kind of like an exportation kind of thing. Uh, we want to take them from one state to another, and he gets these legal documents, and he's going to find them. And even though the city's 140 miles away from Jerusalem, it's a long ways in those days, he's going to go and search out people. Write this down. Number one, Saul was bitterly opposed to Jesus. He hates Jesus. Three times in the book of Acts, Paul gives his uh, testimony. We call his conversion story, how he crossed the line of faith, how he went from a murderous religious terrorist to a, a, a follower of Jesus. He recounts it three times. And in Acts 26, he does it again. He goes, he gives a little bit more information. I, too, was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished. And I tried to force them to blaspheme. I was obsessed with persecuting them. I even hunted them down in foreign cities. That's being bitterly opposed to Jesus, how did it happen? Somebody so antagonistic, so brutally filled with, with just a passionate hate switch at that time. So in the text here, we read Saul was bitterly opposed to Jesus. And Saul goes on to become the Apostle Paul because in Greek, uh, his name would be Paul. And he starts lots of churches. He writes many books of the New Testament that we have a tremendous change as he gets a new purpose in life. So here's, what, here's how the story of this big change happened for him in Acts chapter 9, verse 3. And as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. He replied, uh, he replied, now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. So the road to Damascus uh, takes about 10 days to walk probably, uh, maybe shorter on a horseback, could have been on a horse, we don't know, 140 miles away. Uh, Jesus says this bright light hits him, and I call it the Shekinah glory of God. That's a term from the Old Testament. It's the fire by night that led the people of Israel around in the desert with Moses. It's the star that led the Magi, the Shekinah glory of God. And it just blinds Saul, knocks him to the ground right there. Jesus. And he goes, Saul, Saul. And those terms are, are actually terms of, uh, of uh, fondness. It's like Saul, Saul. Okay. It's intense and emotional. It's kind of like you have a, somebody in your life who's wayward, and you're like, oh, you know, why are they doing that? You know, that, that kind of, that kind of, it's not a scolding kind of Saul, Saul, right? Saul is hunting Christians to arrest. He's executed something. He gets these papers of extradition so he can bring them back and put them in jail. He's hunting people to arrest. And Paul, who is the hunter, is now going to be hunted by Jesus. Jesus hunting him. And it's not a judgment thing. It's a rescue thing. God is on a rescue mission. He's going to rescue Saul from his bitterness. He's going to rescue him. And God is out for you too. Some of you have been running away from God for a long time. 
just been running away, doing your own thing, apathy, whatever you want to call it. You've just been, hey, I'm just focused on me. Just me, 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 me. But God is on a rescuing. And Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? Now, this is very interesting because literally he is putting other believers in jail. He is conspired to have them executed. And when Jesus confronts him, he says, why are you persecuting me? So to persecute the church, the church is not a building. Church is a group of people. Church is made up of people. When you persecute another believer, you are persecuting Jesus. You got that? So every time you slander or gossip against another Christian, you're actually slandering and gossiping against Jesus. And you need to take that seriously. So Paul is there confronted by Jesus. Why are you persecuting me? And he seems to know that it's God because he says, Lord, Lord. Could be translated, sir, sir. But in this context, he knows it's not just some average thing happening here. Something else is going on. First off, Paul realizes that Jesus ain't dead. He's alive. That's got to be a shocker to him. He thought they'd killed him already. All this resurrection business was stupid. No, no. All of a sudden he knows he's alive. Here's what happened next. The men, verse 7, traveling with Saul, stood there speechless. You'd be speechless too. In fact, I'd probably ran off. <laughs> They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground. When he opened his eyes, he can see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind, did not eat or drink anything. I thought it was very interesting he's blind for three days. I don't know if that's very significant. Jesus was in the grave three days. Jonah was in the fish three days. It just sounds significant to me, but he's blind for three days, and now he has to be led by the hand. This person who is pursuing to kill other people all of a sudden is so incapacitated to be led by the hand. And then in verse 10, we read this. In Damascus, that's the same city today. Uh, Damascus is still there. There was a disciple named Ananias, the Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, he answered, I have heard many reports about this guy. And all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. It's a very interesting story, right? So that straight street, by the way, is still in Damascus. still there. Very ancient city. And Ananias gets this vision from God, very direct. You know, go to this guy, Paul, and he's like, I've heard about this guy. Doesn't seem like a good idea to me. Hold on here just a second. What's going on, right? right? In fact, think about it this way. Saul might be there to kill him because he's a leader in some capacity in the church. Saul's after him. And he gulps. You mean that guy? I just want you to function. And uh, about 100 people there, and a guy comes up, and you see a guy over there? I say, yeah, don't tell him you're a pastor. Okay, why? He hates Christians. <laughs> Whatever. I'm used to that. No, 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 I'm serious. If he knows you're a pastor, and there's nobody else in this room, it'd be bad for you. I said, what? <laughs> was, yeah, yeah, he hates pastors. If you were alone on a dark street, he was driving a car, you'd be no more. Wow, okay, I'll avoid him. I told him I was a pastor anyway. So <laughs> I did. Yeah, so everything in this story indicates that Jesus is orchestrating the events to rescue Saul. Okay. Why did he do that? Number two, God pursued Paul for a unique purpose. Why did he go? There's a purpose here. Verse 15 and 16 are key in this section. It says, But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles 
and their kings into the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. So he's going to be an instrument of God, which means a tool. It's like a, a carpenter has tools, a hammer. Uh, he's going to be a representative, an ambassador for Jesus. He's going to talk about Jesus with everyone, okay? So Paul has this kind of purpose, in, and Ananias has to overcome his anxiety about that. And by the way, we have Apostle Paul with this big purpose. Ananias has a big purpose, too. It's to reach out to Paul. He's got to go through with that. Even the obscure person has to has to obey the Lord Jesus at this point. But it's very significant. He's going to be proclaiming Jesus to the Gentiles. Now, a Gentile is a person who's not Jewish. This is simply what it means. And so Paul is called the apostle to the Gentiles in other places in the Bible. And his focus tends to be on the Gentile people, but second, to the kings of the Gentiles. And he actually gets to go appear before a couple governors like Festus and then uh, King Agrippa and then probably Nero as well. Paul actually did those things. He also proclaimed Jesus to the Jewish people because every time he went to a new city, he'd go to the synagogue, he'd start there first, see if people were willing to receive Christ, and then he would move on to the Gentiles and he'd start a church. And so all these things were what Paul lived out as well. He got to proclaim those. Three times in the book of Acts, he recounts his conversion story. A couple things I've noticed about that is Paul um, was chosen by the Lord. He has this unique purpose. He was sent as a witness to people, Jews and Gentiles, like to everyone. His mission would be encountered with rejection and suffering. That becomes clear, bringing a light to the Gentiles. And he will keep a steadfast focus on Jesus was alive because he believed Jesus is dead. He's killing people, incarcerating them because everyone else thinks that Jesus is alive. Paul goes, no, he's not. I saw him on the Damascus Road. And if you trace his history out, he probably spends a few years with Jesus in the Arabia Desert. So Paul spent time with Jesus as well. One of the questions I thought of was, why? Why Paul? Why not Peter? Why not John? Why not one of the other disciples? Why Paul? What's unique about him? A couple of things I think are unique about Paul. He knew the Jewish language and culture infinitely well. He's a Pharisee. He can speak Hebrew and Aramaic. He can read the languages. But he's also really tied into the culture of first century Judaism. He, he knows it inside and out. He just knows the culture. Another thing is he happens to know Greek culture too because he's because of where he was raised. And uh, he could read and speak Greek fluently, probably Latin too, I'm guessing. He grew up in a city called Tarsus. And so he's a, a very familiar with Greco-Roman thought and philosophy of the day. So he knew he knew both worlds and he could navigate. And then he was a Roman citizen. One time we'll come to this place where he is uh, jailed and beaten. And as he's talking to the jailers, he goes, uh, do you do that to all the Roman citizens? <laughs> We're in big trouble. <laughs> because if you're a Roman citizen, you got rights. And all of a sudden, he's, he's flaunting the rights that he has. And he can use that to go from country to country to country because he's a Roman citizen. And it's actually to his advantage. Peter and John, they were not Roman citizens. It wasn't to their advantages. Paul would have been extremely well-trained uh, as a Pharisee. He had the best of the best of the best. He lived in Tarsus, which had a, a Greek academy there. And I'm sure he probably trained and studied there. He knew all the philosophy of the Greeks, as well as all of the thinking of the uh, Orthodox Judaism as well. Another thing that made Paul kind of unique is he had his own professional job. He was a tent maker. You know, it may sound like, ooh, a tent maker. What does that mean? He worked for Coleman? I don't know. But anyway, he, uh, he uh, tent making was a big deal. And in Tarsus, it was the center of tent making of the world. And so he could support himself. He didn't have to worry about where his next meal came from all the time. He could get a job. And another thing about Paul was he must have been an incredible 
incredible, courageous leader, courageous leader to go through all the things he went through. So not only do we have Paul here, but I want to point out, number three, everyone needs someone behind the scenes. And there are a couple of people behind the scenes for him. And one is Ananias, and the other one is Barnabas. And in one sense, they're a little bit obscure. Barnabas will rise to the surface later on in the book of Acts as traveling with Paul. But Ananias is certainly obscure. We don't know anything about him. As soon as the story's over, we never hear from him again. We don't know what happened to him, but yet he follows what God tells him to do. He has this unique purpose and he does it. You might be in that category as well. In fact, I bet if I asked you, hey, anybody here obscure? You feel obscure? Don't raise your hand. So, not, nearly everybody in this room are going to be like, yeah, I'm just kind of an obscure behind the scenes person. Right, right. Well, we need to be reminded because of his obedience to the Lord. Apostle Paul became who he is. And if it wasn't for Paul, we might not be here today because that's how quickly the gospel spread when Paul started preaching. We should never be afraid to obey God's will. You might think, well, I don't have this kind of faith. Paul had this big, you know, Shekinah glory experience and and Aeneas had this prompting of the spirit, you know, go to this place. And But we should never think that because God uses us in incredible ways, incredible ways. Verse 17, it says this, Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me to tell you so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Notice this, immediately. It just happened immediately. Something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. Here's what happens next with Barnabas, this other behind the scenes. When he came to Jerusalem, Paul eventually gets to Jerusalem years later. He tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him. They're just scared spitless. I mean, that's the guy that's resting everybody, right? They didn't believe he was really a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord. The Lord had spoken to him and how Damascus, how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. Here's my thought. When you're living out your purpose in life, you need a cheerleader in your corner. When you're fearlessly living out your unique purpose, you need somebody you can talk to. You need a sounding board. You need somebody that's always there for you. This is people like Ananias and people like Barnabas as well. We need people like that because, well, because left to our own, we're not going to make it. And even though these folks are fairly obscure, Ananias, he's you know never heard it from again. But once you obey the Lord and you're doing what God uniquely called you to do, you're making an incredible impact that you cannot dismiss. It's not obscurity. Nothing significant in our life happens without us obeying the the, the prompting, the bigger picture that we hear from God. So often we think, hey, I'm just, what can I do? I'm just a nobody. No, you're not. The Bible is full. This book is full of people who thought they were nobodies and then they became somebody and God used a somebody to use to do something incredible. Don't ever think that. Don't ever think that. God can use you more than you can ever think. And when you choose to listen and obey, you are living in the grand scheme of God's purpose in your life. Number four, we can impact our world when we persevere. Here's Paul's perseverance. All those heard him were astonished and asked, isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. 
people were shocked that a first century Pharisee would become a follower of Jesus. They were shocked that somebody who had been arresting Christians was now joining. They were shocked that somebody who had always used the scripture to say Jesus is not alive was all of a sudden taking a Bible and saying he is alive. Here is what the scripture teaches us. Sometimes, have you ever seen somebody or known somebody, you go, they became a Christian? I'm shocked. Of all people, they became a Christian. There's some famous people like Johnny Cash. Became a Christian, Johnny Cash. There are others. Paul may have not been ready for that, but yet, man, he crossed the line of faith, and his life was never, ever the same again. In verse 29, it says, he talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus, got him on a boat and got him out of there for a while. If you want to make an impact in life, you're going to have to sometimes make sacrifices, and the sacrifices you make will be painful, and you may be persecuted, you may be suffered all, suffering all because of your faith. Jesus suffered. He suffered in the garden. He suffered on the cross. He suffered uh, uh, as he watched his friends ditch him. Suffering is just part of the Christian life. But we make deep impacts when we live out our purpose. Two months ago, my friend Hal died. Hal was uh, my youth leader when I was a teenager. And he was a, far he was a farmer, lived right down the road. He had three small kids. I was 16, 17, 18. And uh, for 13 years, he was a youth leader, just nonstop. And because of his efforts at his service, lots of people stood up and talked about how he impacted uh, their lives. I am shocked that he put up with somebody like me because at youth events, his car would be parked out in front of the church. And sometimes because of where I grew up, you just left your doors unlocked at your houses and you left your cars unlocked. And that's a big mistake. <laughs> So I, got, I would get in his car all the time. This is in the old days. Some of you are like, what? Cars used to be like this? I would turn the radio up as loud as it could be. I would turn on his wipers. And then I would turn on the air conditioner to full blast. So the minute he started the vehicle, the wipers were going, the radio was blurring, and the fan was on. I probably did that 15 times. But Hal never gave up. He made an impact. See, when you know your purpose and you can go through the suffering, you make an impact. Dr. King made an incredible impact. Hey, moms, any moms in the room? Moms, you're making an incredible impact on your kids. You are the primary person impacting your kids. Don't let anyone ever look down upon you because you're a mom. Dads, don't let anybody look down upon you. Dads, you are impacting your kids. Grandparents, you're impacting your, your grandchildren. Now, I know sometimes that parenting gets a rough knock. Mom, sometimes you feel this, hey, what do you do? And maybe you work full time, maybe you don't. Maybe you work part time, maybe you work from home. And you say, well, I'm raising my kids. So, oh, I'm raising kids, yeah. And then it kind of puts you down for that, right? Here's what, I got some advice for you. Here's what I want you to say. They, really, they say, what do you do? You say, I'm educating two homo sapiens. into the Judeo-Christian tradition so that when the eschatological return comes, they will be there for the utopia that I am training them for. <laughs> and then you say this, what do you do? <laughs> Don't let anybody look down upon you because you're a mom or a dad, all right? All right. This week, yesterday, I called a dad who was struggling, and I said, hey, I got another dad over here, single dad. He's struggling a lot, and I thought you could help him. He goes, I would love to do that, <laughs> right? Making an impact. You don't have to be perfect to make an impact. You just have to be available. I guarantee you that. I got a text the other day. Hey, Pastor Steve, uh, we have Celebrate Recover here at Grace. It's going on since January. And then they told me last week they ran out of chairs in the uh, upstairs room, which I think is 50 chairs. I was there about a month ago. There's about 50 people there. And I thought, holy cow, 
I'm so thankful for the people that lead Celebrate Recovery because they're making an impact and you don't even know who they are. I know who they are. I wish I could tell you all the stories that I have about what goes on behind the scenes and the lives that are being impacted and changed. It is phenomenal. It's phenomenal. Number five, how to know your purpose. For some of you who are thinking, well, I don't know what my purpose is. You know, I, I work. Yeah, we got, we got to work, right? Got to earn a living. Got to pay the bills. Got to get food on the table. But maybe beyond that, maybe it's your purpose is helping students. Maybe it's helping children. I used to have this philosophy when I was more involved in children's ministry years ago. We want a kid to feel like a positive attitude about Christ, a positive attitude about the church, positive attitude about themselves. And sometimes kids just need somebody to love on them or just love on them. I know a person who goes around their neighborhood and just picks up kids on their street that want to go to Sunday school, bringing them to church. Okay? You can be a lunch buddy at noon. You can take noon off and go over here to the school and tutor a kid, just read to them. Your purpose in life. Know your purpose. How are you going to know that? I was having lunch with a college student. Well, he graduated. He was a year into his grad program. I said, he's a sharp, sharp guy. We were having lunch downtown and and I said, well, what are you going to do? And we're just talking that kind of stuff. And pretty soon, I just kind of sized him up. I said, I think your purpose in life is become filthy rich. He looked at me like all of you are looking like, you lost it. He goes, filthy rich. I said, you're a smart guy. I think you're going to go places. I want you to earn as much money as you can. And then I challenge you to give it away to the causes that impact people's lives. Yeah. That's living out your purpose. Go, man, I never thought of that kind of purpose. Let me give you some practical ones. Number, there's one. Look to the scripture and pray. If you want to know your purpose in your life, filter it through this book. And if it doesn't fit here, it's not part of your purpose in life. And then pray, pray, pray. Lord, what do you want me to do? And listen to God whispering to you about that. So scripture and prayer. Here's another one. Look at your life experiences. So look at all. If, if I, I used to have people map this out. Just map out your experiences in life. Hey, I, I was, did this and this. And I've got all these experiences. Well, that might help you and point you in the direction of your unique purpose in life. Right, right. Right, right. You could just just do that. So, I was watching. I don't know, it was The Voice or America's Got Talent, one of those things, and I thought, I'm quitting my job, at Grace Community Fellowship, because I heard those people sing. I can sing better than that. In fact, by the time I have a little bit of voice coaching, hundreds of thousands of people will be coming to my concerts, and I'll sell a million. A million downloads will be for me. I'm going to go places as a singer. I'm going somewhere. That's a lie from the devil. (laughs) Because I can't sing. And I was over here trying to clap on the first song, and I have to look around at everybody else, see if I'm clapping on beat. (laughs) So bad. That's not my life experience. My life experience is not music. So it's not. So it's not my thing, right? I got other experiences in my life. But you look at all your experiences and say, well, I can use those in this way. And here's maybe a fit for that. And sometimes we just kind of force our way in. I remember a man, he said to me, Steve, I'm a great teacher. I want to be a teacher. And I said, okay, well, uh, why don't you try children? And uh, that lasted like six months. He was terrible. It was bad for the children. It was bad for their teachers. It was bad for the parents. And nobody had the courage to tell him, so I had to tell him. And I said, well, let's try something else. So we tried high school, and it was terrible for students. It was terrible for other youth leaders. And I had to tell him that. Then he tried something else. Else. And finally, I had to say, I don't think this is your unique purpose. I don't think it is. You know, he needed to hear that, right? It just wasn't going well. Here's another one look at your natural interests. If you naturally like to go hiking, get a hiking club, man. Spend time with people hiking, right? 
If you're rock climbing, make it be rock climbing. Something like that. Use the things that you're interested in and see if your unique purpose lines up to them. So Friday, I went golfing. I went to play nine holes at Oakway. I only had time for nine. I'm going to play by myself, which sometimes I like. And then all of a sudden, three is backed up. Three people are in joining me now. Three people I don't know. Three strangers. But I count it as an open door, man. I got a captive audience because we're on the golf course. We're not going anywhere for a while. And so I'm thinking, how am I going to get this into a spiritual conversation? And we're out on the green. And this guy has a long putt for a birdie. And I said, if you make that putt, you all thought you died and gone to heaven. He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. If I make this putt, it'll be like I died and gone to heaven. I said, all it takes is faith. You got to believe. You got to have the object to your faith. He goes, yeah, you're right. I got it. Yeah, just believe. Visualize it. Visualize it. You can sink that putt. He missed it by a mile. It's just... <laughs> The end of my evangelizing right there. But anyway, look, you know, at your natural interest. Play golf. I, you know, I talk to people. Look for the opportunities right in front of you. You want to know your purpose? Look at what's going on right in front of you. It's a cue for you. Look at what is right in front of you. Don't ever say, well, somebody else will do that. Maybe God wants you to do that. Maybe that's God's purpose for you for a season. I think our purposes change over time. Sometimes our season of life is this is my purpose and this is my purpose. And I think that's all healthy and good. But you got to look what's right in front of you. Here's another one. Look at the behind the scenes people in your life. Okay. Look at behind the scenes people in your life. Here's why. Because there are people in your life who can give you feedback. You need a sounding board. You just ask him, hey, I'm thinking about this with my life. I know I do this full time for my living, but I'm also thinking about this. I'm thinking about using my job for this in some way as well. Can you get slide six up for me? Thanks. Number six. So here we go. I am thinking about, here's my challenge to you today. Fill that in. I don't know what your thing is. What are you thinking about? For some of you, you're like, I've never thought about this stuff. I don't even know where to begin. That's fine. But just think about it. What is my unique purpose that God is calling me to do? What is it? You heard me say last week, every Christian has a, has, has a mission to people outside the church, and every Christian has a ministry to people inside the church. So what are you thinking about? What's your unique purpose? What does God want you to do? What does God want you to do with your spare time? Sit on the couch and watch TV all day? I think not. It's got to be more to life than that. Because if you don't live out your unique purpose, you will feel insignificant. You will not experience joy. And on top of that, you will be frustrated. You'll be frustrated. So I'm going to pray. And I'm going to give you just a moment moment of silence just to pray about that. Lord, what is my unique purpose? What, what are you calling me to do in my life? Heavenly Father, we are very, very grateful for this story from Acts chapter 9. And God, we are so grateful that you rescued us, that you were on a rescue mission, and that you saved us from ourselves. You saved us from the world we're in. Lord, we thank you that you give us a unique purpose to live out. And so why don't you just take a moment and just talk to God. Say, Lord, what kind of purpose do you have for me? Lord, I pray that we can listen carefully to what you might be prompting us to do. We will be patient. 
until you make it clear. But God, I pray for every person in this room that you would be speaking to them about their unique purpose. God, we pray that even though we may have to sacrifice things, that we would count it a joy because it's your purpose we're living out. We thank you, Father, for our church. We thank you for the purpose you have placed us here. We thank you, Father, for all that you're doing in our church family, and we rejoice. We pray this in Jesus' powerful name.